Hello little buns, it is Steph, welcome back to my home. Finally, for those of you that watch me all the time, you'll know that I've been gone from my home for like more than a month and I'm very happy to finally be recording in my normal setting again, so God bless. But that is not what I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here to talk to you about an article that, well sort of, okay, sort of. I'm here to um, talk more about the hometown that almost killed me and I'm not exaggerating it wasn't like a literal mob was chasing me with pitchforks and torches but it felt like that and it was to the point where I might have done it myself you understand know what I mean you know you know what I'm saying yeah okay so I want to tell you why I felt that way and how other small towns can prevent that from happening you know what I mean because that's really what it's all about is improving the world okay awesome let's just let's get started so I recently had like a three-week period where I wasn't doing anything I just had to relax and recover due to some medical things and during that time period, I used it to kind of do some writing, do some stuff like that, and, and uh, actually I was contacted by my hometown's newspaper, and they wanted to write an article sort of about the surgery I was getting. So for those of you that don't know, that might be new to me, the surgery I got was facial feminization surgery. I am a transgender woman, and I was experiencing a lot of dysphoria around my face. And I got this surgery to alleviate a lot of mental health issues that was causing me. And they wanted to write an article uh, basically about my transition, my experience in Wallaceburg, and they didn't say this, but I interpreted it as they want to give the community that literally exists in a bubble. My hometown exists in a bubble, like Dalaran from Warcraft. It was closed off from everything. They wanted to give that community something to learn about. You know what I mean? So I'm going to basically read through the article, and I am going to comment on it and explain some things, and um, I hope that you guys learn something and you gain some insight into my early life if you know me already and if you don't know me already I hope that this teaches you something about trans people even. So here we go. The newspaper from my hometown is called the Sydenham Current. My hometown is actually called Wallaceburg in Ontario of Canada. It's a small town with a population of somewhere between seven and ten thousand people. I'm not sure that's kind of a three thousand. Three thousand people is a big difference but it's a small town basically is what you're supposed to understand. The article is titled The Journey of a Transgender Woman from Wallaceburg. Now I gave an interview to this reporter, this journalist, and he's very good. He's honest the best journalist I've ever spoken to hands down he's amazing he gave good questions he listened when I raised concerns about certain wording and stuff and and he did great he did wonderful so he starts off the article um, my former name is mentioned in here I'm not gonna mention that it's in the article I just don't like saying it to be honest but transitioning so publicly I'm okay with my name being out there and also the people in this town might know me by name so I'm okay with that name being listed in that town if it's a way for them to understand who I am you know what I mean and how trans people are so I'm not gonna say my name but it's in there. Go read the article. It's linked in the description box. From bullying, name calling, and harassment to isolation, loneliness, and confusion, Stephanie battled with a multitude of issues while growing up in Wallaceburg. Fast forward to 2017, the 20-year-old is a transgender Toronto woman named Steph Sanyadi who has started making the long journey into alleviating, alleviating her mental burdens. That's true. I moved to Toronto when I was 17 years old, two days after high school graduation, because I knew I had to get out of there. My parents were super supportive, I'm a spoiled brat, so they paid for everything for my first year of Toronto, and I've been completely independent since then, and it's been great. Being responsible as an adult and everything is 2,000 times easier than the stuff I was experiencing in this town as somebody who didn't have any responsibility. So. That says something. On Friday, December 16th, 2016, Sanyadi underwent facial feminization surgery in Boston, Massachusetts with Dr. Jeffrey Spiegel, a surgeon Sanyadi believes is the best in the world, that's quoted, when it comes to delivering a natural looking result. I do believe that. I think he's fantastic. If you're interested, I have a playlist of FFS recovery videos you can see in the description box so you can sort of see my chronicle of my recovery from FFS. I'm still not 100% recovered, but I look normal enough to wear makeup, so. The surgery is actually a combination of several different procedures depending on your face and desired outcome. The goal is this is a quote from me. The goal is to basically reduce the effects of testosterone-based puberty and make it look like the patient had undergone estrogen-based puberty in their facial bone and fatty structure instead, Sanyadi told the Sinemham Current. Cool. In total, she had five procedures completed in four hours. A mandible contour, which is a jaw and chin reduction and shaping, a forehead reshaping, a tracheal shave, which is the removal of the Adam's apple, a lip lift, and a permanent lip augmentation. It's very intense and invasive, which is why I put a lot of research and a lot of time into choosing who I trust with my face, she said. Sanyadi said she did not want to disclose the exact cost of the surgery, however, a GoFundMe campaign helped her raise $30,000 from 1,700 donors to help her fill in what she couldn't pay for. Thank you guys so much. I love you. It goes without saying that I am supremely grateful to all of those people. I can never thank them enough. That's true. With a full-time job as a YouTuber, the crowdfunding support was generated by her strong online following. God bless. Why she wanted FFS. Here's where it gets more interesting. Sanyadi said transgender people often experience gender dysphoria, which is a result of being told you're a gender you are not for your entire life. 
until the present. That's not in the article, but that's how it works. Some people say, it feels like we were born into the wrong body, but I reject that notion, she said. There is nothing wrong with my body. I am not changing into another body or another person. I am alleviating mental health issues with a treatment, which is this surgery. And it worked. I feel infinitely better in ways that I can't explain. The assumption that having a penis makes you a man or a boy, which has gone on for centuries, of course, but never so strictly enforced until the last 100 to 200 years, is what makes trans people feel bad to begin with. It's what causes these mental health issues. When I was younger, in elementary and high school, I felt alone, isolated, and misunderstood in every single way possible. I felt 100% isolated because I had no idea what I was feeling. So when I was a kid, I had these feelings that I did not understand. I knew that I was supposed to be a girl, but I did not know how to articulate that because I had no model to base that off of. And because nobody else was experiencing these things, or at least talking about them, I literally felt completely isolated. And I thought it was normal. I thought that was just how people felt. I didn't realize until I understood I was trans and talked to other trans people how lonely I was. And it's like normal for me. That's why I'm okay with being cooped up in my apartment for so long, because it just feels normal. Sanyadi said when she came to understand that she was a woman, and this was totally reasonable and help was available, she jumped through all the hoops she could. Because I've always been uncomfortable with my face since puberty and the changes it brought, I decided to deal with that first. The surgery is a treatment to deal with my mental health issues and it's already worked. The day I woke up from surgery, I felt so relieved in a way hadn't for years and years. So when I opened my eyes, the first thing I did was thank Dr. Spiegel because I knew that everything was okay. It wasn't a physical weight that I felt lifted off my face, but you know how sometimes you feel like a weight is lifted off your shoulders? It felt like that, but on my head. And that's not because I was high or because I was missing a large portion of bone. It might have been because I was missing a large portion. I can't spake a large portion of my bone, but it could also be because I felt relieved in a way that I had never felt before. Difficulty growing up in a small town. Here's the hometown bullshit. So if you were waiting that whole eight minutes or whatever for me to get into the small town stuff, here we go. Here we go. Sanyadi said, looking back while growing up, she never understood that trans people even existed. That's true. I went for at least 12 years feeling perpetually uncomfortable in my body and in my surroundings. I thought this was normal and a result of the other bullying and harassment I was experiencing and not because of a disconnect in my own mental health. For example, when I was a kid and the teacher would tell us, oh my, I burped. Excuse me. To split into boys and girls, I always knew that I did not belong on the boys' side, but I had to go there because that's what I was told. When it came to Viz Ed, the year we started having to change in a change room, grade 7, I failed Viz Ed the entire year because I refused to go in the boys' changing room. I knew I didn't belong there, but I couldn't put a word on it or understand it any deeper than that. Moving to Toronto opened Sanyadi's eyes to the transgender world. When I moved to Toronto and I realized that Wallaceburg quite literally, and I mean this very sincerely, exists in a bubble, it does. I can't explain. It's like nothing exists outside the town and if you if you acknowledge anything outside the town it's like you're a monster. It's so bizarre. There are so many people and cultures and things that I never would have experienced if I had not left. I met trans people. There. I don't- that's kind of a weird way to break the quote, but it's fine. Speaking to transgender people when she was doing her work as a makeup artist led to her own little moment of epiphany. That also felt ma massively relieving, but really I had that feeling all along and all that changed in that moment was that I was able to put a label on it and know how to move forward. Meeting the trans people wasn't a gateway, it was a cipher. It was a translator. This is a cool, I feel like this is a great explanation for this, okay? I understood the gibberish in my head when I met them like it was a key. So I had, I had these feelings before, they didn't, meeting trans people didn't give me those feelings, but meeting trans people made me able to understand them, like a translator. Looking back, Samyadi said she feels she was never a boy. The way it works isn't that we go from one gender to another. I was always a girl, I was born a girl, I wouldn't even tell people I was born a girl in a boy's body. This body is a girl's by virtue of me being a girl. Every woman has a woman's body, that's just how it works. Samyadi said she was assigned male at birth. This is not just me, mind you, this is most people in 2016. I was assigned male at birth. I was saying that in a way that like most people in 2016 in my generation use assigned male or female at birth to explain trans issues, not just me. That does not mean I am male, was male, ever was a boy or anything like that. It means when I was born, the doctor looked at me and decided based on my physical characteristics, boy. And I'm not mad at him for this. This is the way it has been done for centuries. I don't even think we have to change it. I think what we need to do, however, is when your child comes to you and tells you that they're in fact not the gender everyone thinks they are, they need to be taken seriously. That's the thing is I might have, I don't think I ever brought this up to my family, but if I did, I don't know if they would have understood what to do about it. They would have been like, that's weird. Here's your Barbie dolls, play with them. Like, I played with girls. My, my parents gave me Barbies, whatever I wanted. I hated trucks. My mom knew. If I went to the Walmart in the toy section, she knew that the boys' aisle, I would cry in. We'd go into the girls' aisle, and I'd be like, oh my god, look at these dolls. 
you know. So they would give me the stuff, but they would not understand what to do with that information. You know what I mean? Sanyari said, being women, being a woman is not necessarily being feminine and looking pretty. Being woman, being a woman is literally just knowing you're a woman. Like knowing you're a guy means you're a guy. That's all there is to it. There is plenty of trans women that do not present the way I do, that don't get surgeries, and that don't put a ton of effort into cosmetics and their appearance in the way that I do. They are just as much woman as I am, or as your wife, or my mother is. Horrible experience. Here's my hometown bullshit. You ready? Well, Sanyati experienced multiple instances of bullying and name calling growing up. She said one particular incident stands out to her. Because I never left my home, people decided they had to come to me, I suppose, if they wanted to torment me. Which they did, because this happened. One day before I was going to high school, my mom and I left to get into her favorite, most prized vehicle ever, her Jeep Commander. She loved this Jeep. It was her favorite vehicle ever. She said she felt powerful in it. She said it was like armor to her, this Jeep. She screamed first and I ran around to see what happened. Somebody had slashed two of the tires with a large knife, the police said, and they spray painted F a G G O T in black paint across the sides in capital letters. Sonyati said this was the first time she experienced shock, the kind where the world goes quiet and the strength in your legs leaves you, she said. I almost fell over because I couldn't stand. I was, I couldn't believe that happened to me because I felt if I stayed home and I avoided everybody that I couldn't be hurt. But these people brought a weapon onto my, my parents' property and, and destroyed their vehicle. So obviously they, didn't care if that was my space. They wanted to invade that too. It made me feel like I wasn't even safe at home. The police treated it properly like a hate crime, but nothing ever came of it. During this moment, Sonyati said she felt like people wanted her to leave. I never did though, I never wanted to. I figured if I left, someone else would have had to deal with it, so I might as well stay and absorb it. I was used to it at that point. I didn't, it didn't phase me. That phased me because that was so violent. But, you know, name calling, being told I was gay and shit, like I didn't care. I was so used to it, it didn't phase me. So I was like, there's no point in leaving because literally if I go somewhere else, this is gonna happen there too. So I didn't leave. Sonyati said, whoever performed this act was clearly upset about their own situation. They wouldn't have done it purely because they didn't know it was wrong. They would have done it out of direct spite and malice, which means something was going on with them, she said. So I feel bad for them really, and I'm glad they never inflicted harm upon my physical body. Hopefully they're more peaceful now inside and out. I do hope that, because being so tormented you have to hurt somebody else is not a cute place to be. Mental health issues. Sanyati said a lot of trans people experience depression and anxiety as a result of their dysphoria. Constant discomfort and being treated badly by others will do this to you, she said. When I was a kid in Wallaceburg and I was playing with how I presented my gender, I'd wear makeup and tight jeans and dye my hair. People made it clear that I wasn't liked. My home, my mother's vehicle were vandalized, my locker at school was broken into routinely and things stolen on multiple occasions. I was harassed, screamed at weekly. The way I handled this was that I never left my house. Here is where my defense mechanism was. It was isolation, isolating myself. Being in control of the isolation made me feel like I was in control of my life. I lived a few blocks from the high school. I would get a ride almost every day. The avoidance saved me from physical violence, but it has led to social anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, a complex PTSD not war PTSD, both of which I was diagnosed with fairly recently. Sanyati says she has never been diagnosed with a depression and does not believe she has it. No, I don't. That's not that interesting. <laughs> but when people constantly tell you that who you are is wrong, that you're ugly, that you'll never be who you are, yada, 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 it puts you in a very dark place. And I was in a very, very dark place towards the end of high school. I tried to assimilate and be as masculine as I could bear in 12th grade and it sucked the soul out of my body. I felt dead that entire year. I felt dead. I, I, I don't even remember most of it because I just was so bored and so done with everything. I know I poured all of my life into schoolwork and I got great grades, but I hated everything. And I'm glad that I don't feel that way anymore. Sanyati said she has noticed since starting to medically transition that she feels good again. It's as simple as that, she said. I feel happy. I feel optimistic about getting out of bed in the morning. This was before my FFS and mostly from this hormone replacement therapy, HRT, that I've undergone for a year now. That's usually the first step in transition for most people. Um, now when I say like, I feel optimistic about getting out of bed in the morning and everything, I still have days where I feel physically and emotionally exhausted. Mostly because that's the nature of this kind of work where I share so much, I sometimes feel like I don't have anything left. And on that note, like it's important for me to keep some things personal and private. And I do that, um, but sometimes it just, it just is overwhelming and I just have to like do literally nothing for an entire day. But for the most part, life is good and it's not related to me being trans or my dysphoria anymore, now it's related to work. Um, and it's not constant, so it's okay, it's manageable. She said she puts more effort into work, into having and keeping connected with friends, into going places and leaving her apartment, and every single day on HRT she get a little bit more energy. Every person's transition is treated differently, she said. Some people don't want FFS, they might opt for other gender confirming surgeries with HRT or none. Either way, every step in transition is a step taken to make ourselves feel more comfortable in our bodies and 
in the spaces we occupy. She said every day since she started transitioning, the anxiety and the PTSD has gotten a little easier to handle. As lame as this may sound to some people, before transitioning, I couldn't even be on the same side of the street as a house party. They terrified me because I associated them with people who would want to hurt me or make me feel bad. I can actually go to social gatherings now, that is a huge difference to me, and before transitioning, I never would have thought I would want to. So in high school, the only people, like I was never invited to a party. I still to this day, have been to maybe one party. And like, I'm not counting little get-togethers with like 10 people, I'm, t I'm talking about like a party with like music and dancing. I still, due to my anxiety and my PTSD, which sounds like dancing is not something that should trigger your PTSD, but it does, okay? I can't dance. When I try to dance, my body, my body physically makes me run away. Like, I can't do it. I physically cannot bring myself to do it. But I can actually go into house parties now. I mean, not house, I can go into a party and not feel like I wanna die and run away. But I still can't dance. I'm working on it, okay? I'm getting treatment. So Nyadi added, if I had stayed in Wallaceburg, I likely would have never known I was trained just like the several trans people I wager are living in Wallsburg right now. I probably also would have died really young to some unspeakable self-inflicted horror, but we don't have to talk about that. I was in a very dark place. I don't know what could have happened, but I feel like if I stayed on that trajectory, I would have reached that point. How to fix the bubble. Now this is where I'm telling you, here's how we improve these small town environments for LGBT people or anybody that is considered abnormal in that environment, okay? Knowledge and standing up for what is right is some advice Sanyadi has for fixing the bubble she said Wallaceburg was surrounded by. The internet is more powerful than ever and young people have at their fingertips the most vast library of knowledge we've ever had access to. If you think something is unjust, speak up about it. If you see a kid being bullied or harassed, do more than watch to make sure they're not physically hurt. You can know things are wrong, but unless you do something about it, the wrongness is going to stay there. So I had lots of people, when I was being harassed or hurt, they would watch to make sure I wasn't physically hurt. But physical hurt is minuscule next to the amount of damage that was done to my mental health in this place. If somebody had intervened in moments where I was being so humiliated or so hurt emotionally, I would have been a lot better off and I wouldn't have had to deal with all of these issues growing into my adult life. So I beg of you, if you see something wrong, don't just stand there and watch to make sure they're not physically being hurt. Prevent them from being emotionally hurt too, that's just as important. She said, especially in small towns, there are less people and therefore less potential change makers. So in a small town, you have, you all have to be change makers. It's not as scary as it sounds, they can do it, she said. She said, if people have a friend or a family member that is struggling to fit in or is experiencing some kind of harassment or bullying, be there for them. Make sure they know you'll be there for them unconditionally Additionally, she said, if I didn't have my family and my group of friends, I would never have survived high school. It's true. I had a small group of friends and I had my immediate family and that was the only thing that saved me because I could be myself around them. The best that I knew how to be, you know? Next up for Steph. Sanyadi says she hopes to be doing more traveling in the near future through her online work to teach people about trans issues as far as I can reach, she said. I do plan on getting sex reassignment surgery, SRS, which many people wrongfully refer to as the surgery. I'm gonna get to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got really, I got really, I just, all right. There are many surgeries that are just as important for trans women and none of them are compulsory. She says she plans to go to Thailand for that next procedure. I'm not sure at this point where I wanna go, but that's where I thought when I was doing this interview. They have the most experienced doctors in my opinion, she said. I still believe that, but I still don't know if that's where I wanna go. That and FFS are the only two that really stood out as mental health treatments for me. Anything else will be minor and not really too important. And then it says, you can follow us on yada 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 yada. You can follow me on all those places. So. Basically, the point is, I had an awful time growing up, and I absolutely overcame it, and I'm dealing with my mental health issues, but they didn't stop me from becoming an adult and from functioning. And what's really important moving forward to me is to make sure people in small towns are equipped to, to handle people who are different properly instead of being afraid and lashing out at them, okay? So please, share the article in the description box to as many people as you can, because I want people in my hometown to know that being trans is not the end of the world. I want them to know that it's okay to celebrate it. I want them to know that being trans does not stop you from being successful. And giving that article a lot of attention is going to tell them exactly that. And it also, I feel, has a lot of material that can educate people in small towns to not be awful. So please share it. I would love that if you would do that and that, you know, would mean the world to me. Now, if any of you are in small towns, I wanna hear about your experiences that might be similar to mine or different, of course. And um, if you have any tips for people in small towns that want to improve the situation or tips for people to cope as well if they're experiencing the negative end, please let them know in the comments. Leave everything in the comments. I would love to see what you have to say. And until next time, just remember, you are a change maker. And I believe, I say that, I'm saying that sincerely. I see so many people in my comments and on all of my social media that are genuinely change makers. They want to improve the world. They want to make the world a better place. And that means the world to me that you have that ambition. So I want you to hold on to that as tight as you can and make it happen, okay? I love you so much, bye. Ooh, an alarm's going off. Love that. Love